Um, so today I'm going to be talking about terraforming, how to actually make um, a world habitable. And uh, just to clear everything out, terraforming is making a planet or a moon habitable, and more specifically habitable to humans. That's kind of what we care about. Um, but you can terraform other things for not humans, I suppose. Um, so when we first talk about terraforming, we need to understand what we humans actually need to live. Um, when you ask people about this, oftentimes people are like, oh, we need to breathe. I'm like, yes, <laughs> we do need to breathe. Um, so we need an atmosphere that needs to have oxygen. Um, and we also need water. Now, humans can only live like two or three days or whatever without water. Um, but our food that we eat also needs water. And we need water just in everything, just needs water. Um, so we don't just need water to be in buckets for us to drink. It actually has to be on the planet, immersed in the atmosphere and in the ground that we need weather and such. Um, other things that we need. We need what I am saying is a nice temperature and pressure. Um, basically, we need it to be Earth-like. Um, we can deal with pressures slightly lower than what we have on Earth and slightly higher than what we have on Earth. We can deal with things slightly hotter and slightly cooler. But in general, we, we kind of are kind of a, a little bit weak when it comes to life, and uh, we will die very quickly outside of nice temperature and pressure ranges. Um, we also need nice gravity. Um, humans can survive for a short periods of time in microgravity, and uh, we could survive in slightly heavier gravity than we have now, but in general, it should be about Earth-ish. Um, and we need the planet to be rocky. Living on Jupiter would not work out very well. And um, we need a couple other things. One thing that I want to point out, this last bullet point, is something that um, is often overlooked when we, sorry, uh, when we look at um, terraforming or just colonizing some other place. And that's that uh, we need to shield ourselves from radiation. So the sun itself provides us with heat and light, and that's nice, um, but also provides us with things that can mutate us, that can make us sick, and that can kill us. Um, so our atmosphere is really great. The ozone layer keeps that out for the most part. Um, and uh, that's really nice, but if we were to go to another planet that didn't have an ozone layer, we could all just not have a great time. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And then another kind of shielding that we need to keep in mind is uh, shielding from the solar wind. So our sun and other stars have solar winds, which Elizabeth mentioned a bit. And um, the solar wind is kind of interesting. It creates auroras, and that's nice. Um, but without our Earth's magnetic field, it takes away the atmosphere. So this is what happened to Mars. Mars used to have a nice atmosphere, but it didn't have a magnetic field and it lost its atmosphere. Um, so just something to keep in mind. These are all the things that we would like a planet or a moon to have. Okay, so the process of terraforming to make a planet habitable, we would basically take what it was to begin with and make as many adjustments as we need so that it's then habitable or even just Earth-like. So you can think of it as um, adding water or adding gases or removing gases if there's too much, um, removing anything that's poisonous or minimizing it, um, and then just maybe some other minor things, like if it already has water but it's an ice, just melting those. Um, so in terraforming, you can think of the whole range of, oh, maybe we just need to add plants and then it's magically perfect, or maybe it's just a rock and it's horrible and it's gonna take a lot of resources but we're gonna do it anyways. Um, so, quick side note, uh, terraforming, like all great things, started in sci-fi. Um, and uh, there's this thing called xenoforming in sci-fi, which is an alien species terraforming. And that's not uh, what we like, because that will kill us. Um, just so you go ahead, no. Um, another thing is para-terraforming, which is if you want to terraform just a small section of a planet or a moon, and typically, um, like in this artist rendition, it happens in craters. And um, the reason you'd want to do that is maybe the whole rock is completely barren. And it would take way too much time or way too many resources to make the entire planet habitable. But we want to be there for some reason. So if you were to paraterraform a crater or a few craters, um, then you'd be able to keep people there. They'd be happy, they'd be healthy, they would not be dying so quickly. Um, but we would be able to use it as maybe a pit stop or maybe um, a science exploration place. Um, so why terraform? I'm sure you guys can all think of random reasons um, from your own brain or anything, but these are just some that I thought of. Um, exploration and resources is the reason that mankind has spread across um, the planet and why we have started to spread into space. Um, so my guess, personally, is if we start terraforming, that would be one of the key reasons. Um, 
a lot of the reasons that are listed in fiction for why we should terraform is like this backup location for humanity. So in case for whatever reason the Earth is no longer habitable or we all kill ourselves, um, if we have some other place where humans are, then we live on. Um, so that's always really, really cheerful. Um, one thing that is interesting, I think, is that if we figure out how to make a planet that is barren or dying, habitable again, we can actually use that information to backtrack and figure out how to keep our own planet habitable. Um, so we are currently um, messing a little bit with our climate, um, and that's interesting. Um, but if we were to figure out how to maybe make Venus habitable, and Venus is too hot currently, but if we could think of ways to cool it down, um, such as a solar shield or something, that's something that we could potentially apply to Earth. Um, and then the last reason is just because we can. Uh, that's why we do a lot of science, I feel, um, uh, is that we're just able to, so we're going to do it anyways. I don't like... Okay, so um, this little fact is on the slideshow in the beginning. Um, the term terraforming was coined in 1942, in which uh, Jack Williamson's character takes an asteroid, gives it more gravity, gives it a tiny atmosphere, and gives it some water, and then uh, releases greenhouse gases, so the tiny asteroid is now warm. Um, so that's some nice terraforming going on, but um, the idea was actually used beforehand. Uh, the first uh, use that I could find was in Wells' War of the Worlds, in which Martians attack and people die, and it's really kind of terrible, but fun to read. Um, but uh, unrelated to people dying um, is this, this red weed, or later on in different adaptations, it's called a red creeper. And uh, this red weed is said by Wells to be taking over the planet. And he mentions that it's transforming Earth into what the Martians want it to be. Now, he's a little vague on whether that's intentional or not, um, but it still happens, and just to spoil it all, the red weed dies and we're okay. Um, so, uh, in fiction, uh, this is where terraforming started and continues to be. It's so wonderful. Uh, these numbers here for books and film and video games, I just pulled off Wikipedia and then added things that I've read and seen and played and things like that. Um, but it's not an uncommon thing, especially in video games, apparently. We just really like taking over planets. Um, so, from fiction, this is how you terraform, and it looks really nice, especially in three steps. Uh, step one, you find a planet or moon. Usually, people look for planets or moons that are nearby and they're uninhabited, um, but depending on what you read, maybe we're taking over the planet because we feel like it. Um, step two is my favorite. You launch some kind of device and it magically terraforms, and that's like it. And in movies or shows, it's like a two-minute process, or they explain that we launch it and after 10 years, it's done or something like that. I think that's wonderful and totally idealistic and never going to happen. Um, but I think it's great. Uh, step two can also be, depending on what you read or watch or play, um, they, they mention specific things about the planet that needs to be changed. Like, oh, the atmosphere is poisonous. And they say, like, we're going to change it. And then it's changed. Um, and then step three, if humans are not involved in step two, whichever variation you choose, you add humans, and we claim that the planet is terraformed. Now, in fiction, this terraforming process is either immediate, 10 seconds or so, or it takes about like 100 years, um, a couple decades, and it's not too bad. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, uh, real life doesn't work like that. Um, so I've added step 0 on 0 0.5, which is if I were to say we are terraforming where we are now. Um, step 0 is understanding exactly what humans need. Now, I had a slide that had bullet points of, oh, we need air and water, um, and that's all good and dandy, uh, but we need to know exactly what we need. What kind of radiation can we tolerate? How much oxygen at the lower bound or the upper bound needs to be in the atmosphere? Where can we live on this planet? What is the topography of it? If we were to flood it, what would we do? Things like that. Um, and then step 0 0.5 is get funding, approval, resources, and technology. Um, that's kind of usually glazed over um, in fiction. It's nice because you can always just assume you have everything. Um, I will say that as of now, if we decided as a nation or a conglomeration of nations or as a world that we wanted to terraform something, we could start it. We have the money and the resources and sort of the technology. Um, it would just take a while. Uh, so after that, same as fiction, step one, we have to find somewhere to go. Um, and I'll get over, I'll go over a few places that we could go. And then uh, step two is figuring out what the planet has to offer, what needs to be changed. And again, it has to be very detailed because we're actually doing this. Um, step three would be adding or altering the atmosphere. 
And uh, that needs to happen first because any other changes you make after that will be destroyed if there is no atmosphere. Um, step four is get flowing water. So if there is already water there, but maybe frozen, then you need to melt it. Um, and if there's no water there, you have to somehow get water there. Um, things get really fun there because the greatest source of water that we have is in maybe the asteroid belt or maybe out by Jupiter or out in the Kuiper belt. Um, we couldn't just pump water from the Earth. Um, so most suggestions are let's go wrangle us an asteroid and smash it into the planet. And then the water will melt and some of it will stay. Um, this is goes for atmospheres. It's kind of the best way to get an atmosphere. Um, after that, we would introduce durable life. Humans are not durable. We are very weak. Um, so things like microbes or lichens, something that could withstand maybe a slightly different atmosphere, slightly different pressure, or um, less habitable places than our current lovely Earth is right now. Um, after that, we would then introduce plants, maybe some smaller animals, get an ecosystem going, and then we could start actually putting people there. Now, during steps three-ish and on, we would probably have people there, um, but they would be trained and professional, and they would have been willing to probably uh, not make it in case something goes wrong. Um, but step seven or eight would be making it for a full civilization of people who don't necessarily have PhDs and everything technical. Um, so, all right, so terraforming is actually studied in an academic setting. Um, it was first uh, published by Carl Sagan in the 60s, in which he suggested that we terraform Venus by introducing algae into its atmosphere. Um, that was before we knew that Venus was completely poisonous to everything that we have on this Earth, um, so that would not work now. Um, but it was the first time it was actually published. Uh, a couple of years later, he suggested um, terraforming Mars, and his ideas there have gone on through time. So he was one of the first people to suggest melting the ice caps on Mars, and then we would have water again, and things like that. Um, NASA took um, advantage of the sort of momentum that Sagan started and released a, an official paid-for study, which is always great in science, uh, on the habitability of Mars and how to make it habitable to humans, um, later hosting what they call the colloquium, and then in the 80s, the first academic book on terraforming was published. Um, so, depending on how you look at science, this is either really old stuff or really new stuff. Um, somewhere in the middle. Alright, so for mankind as we stand now, obviously some of the things, the terms ideal is depending on who you are and where you are in time and space. Um, but for us now, we want something nearby. Uh, we have not currently invented ways for humans to travel large space in a good amount of time. Um, so even though we have over 3,000 exoplanets, it's not really a good idea for us to decide, like, yes, that exoplanet that is 40 light years away, we are going there. Um, it would be more more realistic for us to focus nearby. So we're going to say that um, for bodies to terraform, we want to stick with the solar system. And that's fine. We have plenty of planets and dwarf planets, asteroids and moons in the solar system that would be great candidates. Um, one other thing is this little terrestrial bit. We have uh, lots of things that are terrestrial and we should not try for Jupiter or Saturn. Just something to keep in mind. And then last, uh, for a body to be ideal, we want it to already have some of the requirements for life. We will, it'd be really nice if it already has an atmosphere, if it already has water, if it's about the same temperature as Earth. Stuff like that. Um, because although we could terraform, let's say, the moon, the moon does not have much water, the moon does not really have an atmosphere, the moon has weak gravity, um, the moon is lacking any kind of nutrients that plants would want. Um, it's just not really a good place to start, um, but I included it up here uh, because it is the closest body aside from Earth that we could terraform. And that's always cool. Um, so, uh, just bodies for suggestions by me. Um, we could do Mercury, Venus, and the Moon, and Mars. Those would be the terrestrial planets and the Moon. And then uh, Saturn and Jupiter have a few moons that are really cool already. And that they already have a lot of water or they already have an atmosphere. Um, so up here, just have Europa, Enceladus, and Titan. Um, those are kind of names that are for now whenever people talk about life in the solar system. That's because they're already really great when it comes to how we understand life to be and where it needs to be. Come on, okay. So, um, for time's sake, I'm just going to focus on Mars. Um, people are already, a lot of different nations are already working on colonizing Mars, um, getting people there in general. 
Um, most of that is in the form of just kind of little habitats. They're not actively working on terraforming. Uh, but I'm going to go through how we could terraform Mars, because um, it wouldn't take that long, like a thousand years. It's not too bad. All right, so Mars already has an atmosphere. Um, it is mostly made of CO2, argon, and nitrogen. However, it is a very weak and pathetic atmosphere. And um, with its sea level pressure and only 1% of Earth's pressure, we currently have no life on Earth that could survive at that pressure. It is too low. Um, even if you think of the most durable bacteria, it is all too low for the bacteria to keep living for longer than any tiny amount of time. Um, Mars has a fairly reasonable temperature range that's not too far from Earth's given, well, other bodies in the solar system. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I'd be perfectly okay with living at 68 degrees for like, the rest of my life. Um, that would be at the equator of Mars, and then on the poles is where it gets slightly colder. Um, Mars is already really nice. It has water. It has these ice caps that you can see down here. And in those ice caps is also CO2. That's a side note. Um, and then it has some subsurface permafrost. So in the regolith, in the dirt of Mars, there is frozen water. Um, one cool thing, it has a buffer gas. Um, in case you had never thought about it, if we were to make an atmosphere of only oxygen, any kind of spark could ignite it. We'd all die. Um, so on Earth, we have a lot of nitrogen. That's really great um, for our survival. Um, but Mars has a few problems that need to be really readily addressed. And I think the most, the largest one is that it does not have a magnetic field. Now remember that I mentioned the Earth's magnetic field keeps our atmosphere in place. And without it, we would lose our atmosphere to the sun and its solar wind. Um, and that's exactly what happened to Mars. So some years ago, uh, Mars had a nice atmosphere. Mars was warmer and it had probably a full water system going on. It had rain and it had flowing water and it was wonderful. Um, and then it lost its atmosphere and then it froze. And uh, now it looks, well, it still looks cool. Um, so a lot of the science that is going into how we could terraform Mars is looking into how to keep its atmosphere. Um, you can think of it two ways. We could try to give it a magnetic field somehow with magnets. Um, or we could just have a continuous system that would pump out an atmosphere every some number of years. Um, the current estimates is without a magnetic field, we would need to replace the atmosphere every 100 years or so. I don't know how we're going to do that. That's a really short time scale. Um, but maybe we could do some combination. Maybe we can slow down the lost atmosphere and only have to replace it every 200 years or something like that. And then currently, uh, Mars doesn't have enough of an atmosphere. Um, but there are ways that we can get around that because we are clever. Um, all right, here we go. So this is just one study that was done a couple years ago on how to terraform Mars. Um, and uh, this text up here is really small, so I made it bigger. So um, the first step, stage one, on the far left, um, would be a series of survey missions. We already have numerous orbiters that have gone around Mars. There are still more to launch. We have rovers, and rovers are wonderful, and they sing happy birthday to themselves. Sorry, I think that's the right. Uh, but um, we would actually need to put people there. Um, people are, as far as we can tell so far in our experience with robotics, probably the best way to gather the most amount of information the quickest we can. Um, because we'd actually be able to dig into the dirt and then run like 5,000 tests on the dirt. Um, so this study suggested 100 years of survey with people on the planet. Um, given our current administration, that'll probably be expedited. Um, we, we don't like to wait 100 years. Um, so well, maybe like 50 years or something. Um, and then after that, like I mentioned in the previous stage, you want to create an atmosphere. So Mars has water and CO2 frozen in its ice caps and in the permafrost. And if we were to warm that up, we could release it into the atmosphere. Now, I find this to be really ironic, but one of the best ways to do that is to pollute the planet. Does that sound familiar? Um, so if we were to start building factories and mining Mars, we could actually start warming up the planet, create CO2, and release what's already frozen there. Um, this would have a nice little positive feedback loop, as we know, and then the planet would then warm up, and then everything would start melting, and the air would be released, and so on and so forth. So for Mars, that would actually be really good. Um, eventually, after about 100 years of that, we would have enough water melted, and we would have enough of an atmosphere that we would, again, have a water cycle on the planet. Um, we would have rain, and we'd have flowing water, and this is wonderful because that's what we need for life. Um, so after we have rain, we're able to introduce what I call this durable life. We could introduce um, algae and microbes and lichens that could actually start transforming this rock plus water into something that's more Earth-like, something that has soil and something that has nutrients in the soil. Well, like these.
of just durable life is when we could start putting on less durable life, um, grasses, then ferns, flowering plants, and then eventually trees. Now this 400 years is based off studies that we've done on the earth, on Iceland or other volcanic flows, and that's just about how long it takes for lichens and other small life forms to create soil out of lava flow. Um, so that's not really something we can speed up as of now. Um, but eventually, after 900 years from starting this, we could start building things for people. And eventually, years for humans to grow out without any kind of masks and tanks. Um, so, but after a thousand years, we would have terraformed the planet. So that's something to look forward to a thousand years from now. This thing really hates me. cynical comments, uh, you realize that there are some challenges involved in terraforming the planets around us and the moons. Um, I feel the biggest one is time. Um, as a species, we are um, not very patient. Um, the minimum requirement of a thousand years to terraform seems pretty daunting to us. And I don't really know if we could convince anyone to dedicate billions of dollars over a thousand years to terraform a planet. Um, what if we put that be cool? Um, Another challenge is resources. This would more, be more specifically for a body that's not quite as nice as Mars, something that doesn't have an atmosphere or doesn't have water to begin with. Um, something like Venus, that's poisonous, um, would be take a lot more resources and time and money um, than Mars. Um, I have money up here with a question mark. We currently have plenty of money on the planet right now that we could do this. Whether those people holding the money are willing to give it up to terraforming is a different story. Um, and that goes into desire. I currently don't think we have a reason to terraform. Um, I mean, that's just a me thing. But convincing people that there is definitely a reason and we have to do it will be pretty difficult. Um, and the last thing is ethics. Just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean that we should. Um, I know from all of my, my sci-fi reading and watching, um, things that we even think to be uninhabited are oftentimes inhabited, and then there's war, and uh, that's just sci-fi. Um, but that doesn't mean that it won't necessarily happen in real life. Um, and I will leave you with this art and rendition of planets becoming habitable. And I'll take questions. Thank you. So the question was, do I have any idea of what order of magnitude of magnetic field is required to uh, retain an atmosphere? Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, so um, I guess it'd have to be something related to the Earth, but it depends on the mass of the planet. So the more massive the planet, then the more likely it is to hold on to its atmosphere. And I mean, Mars in particular is a tenth the mass of Earth, um, so it's not really helping us much there. Uh, but it also depends on how much solar radiation you're getting and um, so, order of magnitude, Earth-ish. Okay. All right, so the question was, how difficult would it be to terraform Earth after Earth is all messed up? Um, so that depends on how messed up Earth is. Uh, if we were to just, as humans, destroy it, um, it wouldn't be that bad to terraform. I mean, most of the materials would already be here still, assuming that Earth 
I mean, humans survive too terrible. Um, if we were to, uh, I guess it would just be how much of the material is still here. So if we lose all the atmosphere, we'd have to go through the whole process of trying to find an atmosphere somewhere else. Um, if we lose all the water, we'd have to find water somewhere else. Um, things like that. But I mean, it'd be probably a lot easier to terraform Earth over Mars because we'd have more of a desire to do it and a need. Um, and we would know that it would work out sort of in the end, for sure, because it was once upon a time habitable for humans. Um, it's very hopeful. <laughs> Future is very bright, in which we have to transform Earth. <laughs> Um, well, if we had terraformed something to begin with, and went there for a little bit, and then had a terraform Earth, we would be here. Since, since we have billions of I'm just paraphrasing that. Um, I'm going to go with no. Because uh, xenoforming specifically is by a species that is alien. Wait, I think that was a plot of the segment. They were like creating the planet. Yeah, I mean, also, also Dr. Hoover. Like, we're just making the planet with someone else's free plot. So, if like one of the things we were talking about for terraforming Mars is that we, you know, release the gas into the atmosphere um, to try to build up the atmosphere. But will it, like, how do you keep that from just being stripped away immediately or from escaping the planet since Mars doesn't have as much mass to hold on to those gases? So, uh, if we were to ignore the solar wind, we would be able to keep the atmosphere on for a substantial amount of time. Um, on the order of hundreds of thousands of years, which for mankind is pretty cool, because that's as long as we've been here. Um, but with the solar wind, we would have to do something about it, um, because we would have to um, replenish the atmosphere every hundred years or so. 